Namo tasa bhagavato arhato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arhato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arhato sama sambuddhasa Aparuta tesan amata sadwara yeso tovanto pamanchantu sadha So, in, in, I've been a monk for 13 years now, and uh, in that time I've, I've uh, done quite a few remarkable things, things which I would never have got the chance to do otherwise, and uh, many things that I feel very embarrassed and ashamed about, and, and many things I feel very proud about, and I've done lots of wonderful, been able to do lots of wonderful things, like give a Dhamma talk under the Bodhi tree for example, and uh, meet many very interesting people. But one of the proudest, my proudest moments in my life as a monk came last week when I, when I told Ajahn Brahm a joke and he said, oh, I'll use that next Friday for my Dhamma talk. And I thought, oh, this, this is like I've reached a peak in my career. <laughs> and uh, the joke goes like this. The two monks sitting in a cave. One of them said nothing. And the other one said, I was just going to say that. (laughs) 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 So, there you go, that was entirely irrelevant and has nothing to do with the subject of the talk. <clears throat> I mentioned in the, in the uh, introduction during the uh, uh, leading up to the Guided meditation, a little bit about the the, the notion of, of what it means for something to be sacred, and uh, so I might talk a little bit more about that uh, this evening. And uh, one of the most uh, you know, the, the, the Latin root of the word we call uh, uh, sacrifice. We have this word sacrifice in English, and the Latin root of that means to make sacred. Of course, the word sacrifice has, like, like all very ancient words, has become worn out. It's become, it's become a, a, like a dead metaphor, which we kind of use uh, <clears throat> in very kind of mundane and uh, ordinary ways. Uh, but the, the original meaning of sacrifice was something which was very powerful and very extremely um, shocking, still very shocking and still very hard to grasp and something which I've, uh, one of my interests or hobbies is, is looking at the roots of, of spirituality and, and uh, religious consciousness in humanity and try to look for why, why, why do we actually, why is religion such a ubiquitous Phenomenon in, in, in humanity. If we listen to the words of the the uh, rationalists, people like Richard Dawkins and so on, and they'll try to uh, show us that religion is sort of utterly uh, irrational and utterly baseless in in fact. And uh, of course, then being very hard pressed to find a reason why then people all around the world believe in it. And uh, <clears throat> of course, this being uh, one of the less uh, persuasive aspects of um, uh, the thought of people like Richard Dawkins and the, the modern atheists is that they don't give a, a really satisfying, a very deep level uh, understanding of what uh, religion is and how it moves people. It's not to say they don't have any explanation, but just the explanation tends to be a bit shallow. But if we look at religions and spiritual practices all around the world, then we can see that this notion of sacrifice is uh, very fundamental to them. And, uh, you know, we, we've kind of got this almost 
cliched image of uh, kind of you know primitive religions and ancient civilizations where they kind of do human sacrifice and uh, uh, you know we think of the Mayan civilizations and the sun temples and you know horrific uh, killings and so on and of course these things did go on but what's rather startling is how universal it was and when we look at the the origins of cultures all around the world then we always find somewhere is this notion of sacrifice and uh, whether in ancient China or ancient India or ancient Europe or the ancient Americas and it's always there why why do people uh, come to this very strange idea of, of, of killing uh, either human beings or animals or, or whatever killing and, and, and rending of flesh, spilling of blood as somehow being a sacred thing. And for, for us from a modern perspective, it's very difficult. I find it very, very difficult to understand why people would think like that. And uh, we've, we've got used to uh, religions where uh, uh, the, sacri the notion of sacrifice has become very symbolic. So in, in Christianity, of course, then you still... <laughs> You know, you eat the slice of bread. So, in one sense, in a literal sense, you're sacrificing the bread. Okay, that's been sacrificed. But of course, the bread is supposed to also be the flesh and blood of Jesus. And the the Catholic Church is very um, emphatic about this, although they perhaps don't advertise it as much these days as they once did. But uh, they certainly don't believe that the the Eucharist bread is symbolic of the flesh of Jesus. They believe that it actually is the flesh of Jesus. This is their doctrine of transubstantiation. I don't know, Don is a biologist. He might be able to uh, have an opinion on whether it actually is human flesh that's being eaten. But what's interesting is the, 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 the necessity of insisting, the religious necessity of insisting that it is actual cannibalism that's going on in the churches on Sunday. Okay? And this is, this is what they, they, they insist. This is not my... my, um, my uh, I'm not forcing this interpretation. They actually insist that the, the flesh of... that the bread becomes the flesh of Jesus. So there is actual cannibalism going on in the church every Sunday. And not just ordinary cannibalism, but uh, uh, regicide, the, the, the killing and, and eating of the king. Yeah, and also deicide, the killing and eating of the God. So this isn't, this isn't just ordinary human flesh. Okay? This is very serious stuff. There's actually like a ritual eating of the king, God King who is slaughtered and then we eat him. Well, well I, I did anyway. When I was a kid, I was growing up, you go along to Mass, you go or walk up to the front. They don't explain to you Oh, would you like to have a, have a chomp of this dead god king, which we've just we, <laughs> we've just cut up and dismembered for you, like Osiris or something like that? And here's a piece of his body, and you can sort of you can chomp this down. They don't actually quite put it in that way, but nevertheless, uh, I remember one time when I was at mass. One of the very few things I remember from my going to mass for years as a child, and uh, usually it's a good chance to catch up on a bit of bit of uh, sleep. But the, one of the things I do remember was when the priest asked, what miracle happens here every week? And uh, all the congregation, of course, sat there silent. <laughs> and the priest got a bit kind of annoyed with everybody. But he said, what miracle happens here every week? And then he said, the miracle of the transubstantiation, the, the bread and wine is, is through the power of the, the whatever it is, the hocus pocus or whatever it is, is tr literally trans transmuted into the, or transubstantiated, they say, into the flesh and blood of Jesus. So that the word transubstantiated, like the substance of it, has actually been changed. So isn't this a bit odd? Don't, don't you find this a slightly weird thing for people to be doing? There's millions and millions of people all around the world doing this, and they're quite respectable. You know, you probably even know some Catholics, right? And, and they, 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 they kind of participate in society. They vote in elections. We've got cannibals choosing our next prime minister, you know. And what, what's actually going on here? Why do we tolerate or why do we, we, we insist upon behavior within a religious context which is so utterly 
different from anything we would do in a secular environment. So utterly opposite. Okay. So you know, you can imagine if we were to do this in a secular environment, what we would do. Now, I mean, this might be be you know, be just uh, provoking some unwholesome fantasies. But what we'd actually do at the end of John Howard's next term, right? <laughs> <laughs> we would kill him, cut him into little bits, and the whole nation of Australia would take a share in eating of his flesh. Okay? And <laughs> this, was, this was how kingship ended in, in, in ancient times. And this was one of the great themes of uh, uh, Sir James Fraser's book, The Golden Bough. And he talked about this practice of, of ritual regicide where the old king would be sacrificed at the end of his reign. And uh, that practice of, in, a, in culturally, I mean, originally it stems from, from tribal practices or even you can be traced to primate practices where the, 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 the dominant male of the, the tribe, when they get old, they're no longer able to defend the tribe like they did in the old days. So when they get old and they get weak, they're challenged by the younger males and so on and eventually gets toppled and usually gets driven out and so on. So we can trace these things back to a very, very ancient history. And uh, so when we, when, we, when we begin to look into the roots of these things, the roots of religions and, and uh, sacred things and spiritual practices, we find that our, our, our conception of them becomes, these things becomes rapidly challenged. And uh, you know, we have this idea, and, and you know, from a Buddhist point of view, you know, where, where, where religion, spirituality is very nice. See, Buddhism is a very nice religion. Okay, we've got a nice picture of a nice man sitting there, and he's very kind, and he's just peaceful, and he's just sitting there in, in meditation. And we're very kind of, we don't, we don't go around, uh, you know, there's no kind of whipping and beating and all the cutting off of hands and all of these kinds, there's no curses and, and all of these kinds of things. So Buddhism is very, very gentle and, and very rational. And so if we've, if we've been brought up in that kind of culture, then uh, we think that this is normal. And within most other religions, uh, of course, uh, you know, they don't do all the cutting off of hands bit and all of these kinds of things anymore but they're still found there within the, their sacred texts, okay? So they find ways of interpreting their, uh, their way around them. But we don't have to look very far underneath the surface of, of these spiritual traditions to find practices which are extremely violent, extremely violent, and, uh, and brutal beyond um, anything that we could conceive of. It's brutal, it's brutal in a way that... that, that uh, uh, just, just you know, it's just almost unimaginable. You know, I just I could give many examples from history, but there's you know, one example of a, I was talking about regicide of the the regicide practice of of a king in India, which was described where the the old king, who's to be sacrificed, actually cut his own flesh off, and this was observed, and he would cut pieces of his own flesh, and then cut them all off one by one until he eventually he just fainted from the loss of blood. These are the kinds of things people do under the power of religion. Another example, the uh, was well-known practice of sati that they would do in, in ancient India. When the husband died, then the wife would uh, kill herself uh, at the funeral. And there was a f I read a very, very uh, striking description of this in one, one time where this young man died, and his wife was still quite young, I think in her teens. And uh, he was buried... And she got down into the burial pit, okay, and was just sitting on top of his coffin or on top of his grave, maybe just on top of him, his corpse, I'm not sure. And as she would sit down there cross-legged and holding her hand in the air and twirling her finger around like this. And then they just put, started throwing the dirt on top of her. And so they just filled it up with dirt up, and, up until her head and then over her head up until her hand and then the last thing they could see her finger just keep on kept on twirling around like that just to show that she even at that last time she still had no no objection or no was still totally committed to it yeah <laughs> so 
the point I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to convey the impression is that, of here is, is the extent to which religious and spiritual practices transgress our ordinary secular practices. And again, this, this turns upside down our kind of Sunday school idea of what religion is. Sunday school idea of religion is telling you what to do so you don't do naughty things. Okay? But then when we, when we start to look at the religions, we see that actually the religions themselves are doing and justifying things which are much, much naughtier than anything which you're told not to do on the Sunday school. Yeah? So you, again, just to, 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 to understand this or to, to broaden your consciousness, you, know, you go along to the Mass, for example, if you're in the Catholic school, and I, you know, I'm only giving you a Catholic example because it's what I'm familiar with. I was brought up as a Catholic. You go along to the Mass where you indulge in cannibalistic deicide, okay? eating of the murdered God, Okay, and then you go along to a Sunday school where they say, you know, be kind to people, and <laughs> and don't 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 be nasty and don't say bad words and so on. And they do that on the same day. Yeah. Again, there's something very strange about this, which we normally don't. We be, we become inured to it. We think our religions become very tame. They become they become uh, domesticated. So there's something about uh, religious practice and religious ideas which is extremely transgressive and which, which um, uh, allows within a limited or within a delimited sphere uh, behaviors and, and ideas and practices which within the broader sphere are considered completely um, outrageous. Now perhaps this is actually one of the functions of that in the, in, in, in the evolution of society is, for example, you know, we take a practice like, say, uh, murder. Right? Now, in, in past times, the statistics seem to indicate that in uh, days of old, murder was much more common than it is today, uh, even though we, we believe that murder, the murder rate is going up. In fact, the opposite is true, and as far as the, we're able to tell from statistics that uh, the murder rate today is, is vastly lower than it was at most points in history. And so we can think perhaps back into in tribal times or something like that when for, for one, one person to kill another person wasn't so rare. Now, so then the practice of sacrifice or human sacrifice is somehow containing that. So this is perhaps can be seen as one of the, the, the purposes of it, is that it's contained and it's legitimized within a certain context so that our outbursts of anger and rage and hatred and so on can be focused. Okay? Now, this is just one aspect of, of the meaning of sacrifice, but we can see how these notions of, of the sacred is, becomes very complex. It's not just religion is not just about doing what is good and not doing what is bad, but is about a re, creating a space where there's a revaluation of what good and bad mean. And within the religious context, that good and bad can have a, a, a different kind of meaning than they have. In fact, it's quite often is the purpose of it is to turn upside down the values of what is good and bad. Now, that, that, that then creates a very, very powerful energy. Okay? And it's an energy which is extremely destructive or potentially is very destructive and chaotic. Uh, and f so for that reason... Uh, this is the reason religions create boundaries around these things. So, again, just to give another example from history, a very common one is what they call the, the known under different names, but known as the carnival or the bacchanalia. And this is usually like a period where all of the rules of society are relinquished and set, let, let upside down. One of the traditional bacchanalia periods in ancient Egypt was between the 25th of December and the 1st of January. So this still remains the period of the Bacchanalia to this very day. Yeah? And the 25th of January was, the 25th of December was the birth of Osiris. Now during this period, a lot of the, the, the rules of society become turned upside down. So for example, in ancient Rome, you had the custom where uh, the, 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 the slaves would become the masters. The masters would become the slaves. Okay, for those few days. So the, the slaves could order their masters around, eat all of their food and drink all of their wine and, and anything they wanted. And they, that's what they would do for 
that period three days or five days or so, however long that period lasted. And at the end of that, of course, they've all got an almighty headache. <laughs> so I wake up and then you get back to normal again. Yeah? Because, and, that, and, and so it's you're like lo letting loose those forces of chaos, which actually, if those forces were to operate all the time, of course, it would just destroy the society, it would destroy the culture. But it's let loose within a certain period of time and then boundaries are kept around it. So that notion that the boundaries that actually contain what is sacred uh, are then very, very important. So those boundaries can uh, consist of many different things. Most obviously is a physical boundary of like a, a temple. Okay, So you can create a place like a temple or a sacred space where those things can happen. Another boundary uh, is a boundary in time where certain sacred days are allotted for these particular kinds of activities and so they are bounded off by time. Uh, or they can be bounded by people, uh, in the sense that it can be certain people who are uh, enabled or allowed to go through some kind of initiation where they are then permitted to, to, to do these kinds of things. So this is, these, are, these, are, these are different aspects of, of um, uh, the sacred or of the religious, that, that, that in some way the sacred or the religious involves a sense of transgression, which goes against the way of the world, goes against what is considered normally appropriate or suitable. Uh, so I wonder what Buddhism does that, that, that might parallel that or might be similar to that in certain ways. One of the... the um, and in many ways, Buddhism is also similar. We, we also set up... Um, sacred spaces, we set up our temples and monasteries and so on and they are, they are uh, like realms or physical realms within which spiritual practice happens. We also have sacred times, like for example we have like the rains retreat, you know, or we have the Uposata days once every fortnight where, where there's like considered special days and so on and they have the Waisak, this is the Waisak season. So we have a special times uh, we, have, of course, have special people. In a sense, we have ordained communities and different, different levels of ordination, which is like a kind of initiation thing. So there's different communities uh, where different levels of spiritual practice or different kinds of spiritual practice apply. And so in those kind of... The, the externals of the religion, it seems to be the same. But what's the, the transgressive thing that's going on? Like when we come to the Buddhist monastery, we're not doing human sacrifice, Right? We're not even doing animal sacrifice. Right? This is what Bhante Gunaratna, one of his stories was that he was, they were accused of doing animal sacrifice in their monastery in West Virginia. Someone said, oh, all the dogs in, in the local area are disappearing. Yeah? And then the, mon <laughs> the monks must be capturing them in the middle of the night and taking them back and slitting their throats in these ghoulish ceremonies. But no, 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 we don't do that. We don't even do like a symbolic sacrifice of bread or anything like that. You know, there's even, even that is not really done. If, if the sacrifice has a physical or, or literal counterpart in, um, in Buddhism, it's the offering of dana. And so the offering of the, the, the food for the sangha every day uh, was certainly conceived of and presented as being a substitute for the act of sacrifice in ancient India when it was presented. The same kinds of language is used and the same ideas are used. Uh, and so instead of, of course, Buddhism rationalizes everything. So instead of going and offering food to a, a deity who's living in a tree, okay, where it's usually just food just stays at the bottom of the tree and rots and doesn't actually get used, so well, you can go and offer it to the Sangha and it's more useful. So this was the way that, that those kinds of practices were co-opted into Buddhism. So in a sense, we have that idea of a sacrifice. And so in a sense, that's quite transgressive, isn't it? Because normally... Um, normally we, we do things, the way we do things is because we want to get stuff. Yeah? So we go and we work, we, we study so we can get a degree or we, we, we do a job so we can get an income and, and, and we're concerned, our lives are concerned with what we can get, what we can buy, what we can have. And uh, so when it comes to uh, uh, a relationship with the Sangha then our mind turns the other way. So instead of turning to what we can get, it turns to what we can give and to recognizing that it's through giving that we become happy and not through getting. So in that sense, that's, that's quite transgressive because it's, um, it's challenging 
uh, those notions of uh, where happiness comes from. So this is one way in which uh, um, Buddhism sort of uh, takes up or, or uh, uh, adapts this kind of religious uh, ideology. Of course, even the existence of the, the Sangha, in a sense, is, is quite transgressive in a way, isn't it? Because like, we don't actually produce anything. Normally, it's kind of, you feel that if you want to be a you know, productive member of society, you've got to actually do something. Yeah? And you know, what, are, what are the monks and nuns doing all day? They're sitting in, a, sitting in a cave or sitting in a hut, not doing anything. And uh, of course, that's not really true. We do actually do things. But still, the, in terms of that, what's the basic product that we produce, it's not anything. And it's not measurable. Uh, what what the, the progress that somebody makes in meditation or something like that. You know, you can't make a, record, a report card out, out about it. You can't have a, an examination at the end of the year and see who's done their, their meditation properly. It's not like the kind of thing. And so, we're, in a sense, we're rewarding idleness. Yeah? Is that right? Instead of saying, we're going to give you some money so you can do some work, you're saying, we're going to give you some money so you can not do any work. Yeah? And in a way, that's, that's almost like kind of vicarious idleness, isn't it? So I'm going to do some w w plenty of work so I'll have some enough money so I can give to the Sangha so that they can not do any work. Yeah? <laughs> so I can't be lazy myself, then I'll, but I'll be able to help others to be lazy in my stead. That's one way of looking at it anyway. Yeah? And it's quite, it's quite a nice way of looking at it, actually, because we have this, we have almost this fetish our society have this fetish for work and time and efficiency and all of these kinds of things. And we, 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 we just kind of forget that actually life just is, you know. And, and you don't have to be in the fastest car. You don't have to be going to the next meeting, you know. It's just none of those things are actually very, very, uh, uh, when it comes down to it, none, none of those things are very important. And uh, it was... Quite a, a nice remark. I, I, we, I saw um, Al Gore's in Inconvenient Truth the, the other night, and well, it was one of the, the things in there that he said that actually made me, I took notice of. He said when his, his son became, was in an accident, became very ill, and so he spent, started, just went to spend all his time by, by his son's bedside, you know? And he's it was like his whole diary just whoosh, just everything fell off it, you know? It's just like a wind swept through his diary. He was a presidential candidate and all of these kinds of things, whoosh, none of that matters. You know, only this one thing matters. And so this is to see that, that all of those things that we, th we think are so important, we put them in perspective. We say, well, you know, how important is that really? And so uh, this is something that I try to be very careful of in the monastery because, you know, as a Santi is a very new monastery and we're still doing building and preparing things, setting things up and so on. So there's always a lot of things to be done. And, you know, I can always look around and think, oh, my God, there's so many things to need to do. And uh, so you, you always need to kind of restrain yourself to not be asking the people there to do too much because that's not the point. They're not there to do things. You know, they're there to meditate, to find peace. And if somebody just wants to sit there all afternoon and watch the grass grow, then good on them. That's what I say. Go and do it. Yeah? And uh, this is a valuable job to be doing in the monastery. And uh, so we want to create, that in a sense, that's, that's creating some kind of sacred space where that's, that's allowed. And it's actually support, it's not merely allowed, it's actually supported and encouraged to not doing anything. Yeah? So in a sense, as you can see, this is like going against the, the way of the world. Another way that... that uh, monastic community obviously is, is very transgressive is our relationship to sexuality. And of course we've made this choice to be celibate. And so we just decide, okay, we've had enough, we're going to step outside of that, that realm and, and that's it, you know. And we're going to try to uh, uh, develop our minds and find peace and happiness through, uh, through the purity of the mind. Uh, rather than through uh, 
sexual pleasure. So of course this also is very transgressive and this, this challenges a lot of the basis of, of uh, our society. What's the basis that, that families are built up from? Uh, the basis that, that uh, uh, of fertility and, and reproduction. And so this is what some people say, you know, what, what would happen if everybody became monks and nuns, you know, what would we do? Then the world would be, would be all, the world would fall apart, you know? To which I reply, what would happen if everybody became hairdressers, you know? There'd be just so much hairspray in the atmosphere that we'd all just choke on hairspray, you know? <laughs> So, but that's that's very challenging, yeah. And and in a way, that's that that um, the that the practice of celibacy is is a very serious transgression of the the values and the the um, uh, the direction of our of our human culture. One of the, the you know the basic uh, almost uh, evolutionary. Um, steps or, or, or necessities of, of human culture is to be able to sustain itself. If, if human cultures are not successful to be able to sustain itself and reproduce themselves, then they don't exist. They get, they get uh, outcompeted and, they, and they, they're not around anymore. Those societies which were not able to reproduce and sustain themselves through the years, they're not around anymore. They don't exist. Only those ones which were able to do that are still here. And so Buddhism, in a sense, is... Uh, saying, well, we're not going to join that rat race anymore. Yeah? We're not going to... Our value, our priority is not on uh, you know, sustaining our culture, sustaining even our human race. Yeah? And so the old, if we look at Buddhism from the ultimate value, then it's very, very challenging. It becomes extremely transgressive. Buddhism actually says, well, actually... You can actually think of that. Would, what would actually happen if everybody became monks and nuns? Yeah? Instead of saying, oh, this would be ridiculous, what's that? what would actually happen? Now, well, first of all, there'd be a big run on all the, all the department stores to try and find all the yellow sheets in the department stores, right? <laughs> and everyone would just go off, imagine that, everyone would just go off into the forest to meditate, right? And, and the, whole, the whole of Sydney, imagine that, the whole of Sydney, everyone shaving their hair and then just thinking, whoopee, that's it, let's just go off and get Nibbana. And they just run out off into the, the, the hills and sit under trees. Everywhere you'd go, through the Blue Mountains and through the national parks, you'd just see monks and nuns sitting under all of the trees, just meditate, 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 meditate. Millions of them. And it'd be the same in all of the cities all around the, the planet Earth. That would be transgressive, wouldn't it? That would be a definite alteration in some of the, the customs of a society. Because what would happen then, because no one's producing food anymore, right? No one's growing food. Again, that's very transgressive, to not grow food. So since all the, the supermarkets are abandoned, right, nobody owns them anymore, right? So it would be okay for the novices, right, <laughs> to liberate the supermarkets and to come and offer them to, to the monks and nuns. That would be allowable under Vinaya, so that would be okay. So as long as the supplies from the supermarkets lasted, then you could have your, your one meal a day. But that wouldn't last very long. That would only be a few weeks. And then you'd start to... You wouldn't have any food, so you just have to really get intent on your meditation. Meditate, 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 meditate. Until, you, until people just started dying of hunger. And so you have millions of monks and nuns in all of the forests all around the world just sitting there meditating until they, start, until they die until the whole human race within just a few weeks has died striving in meditation. And then all of the forests all around the world are just filled with corpses wrapped in yellow robes. Wouldn't that be amazing? And what would happen then if, if an alien spacecraft landed <laughs> <laughs> and then looked and said, what kind of race was this? What would they think? They'd come down and they'd see all of this, these, you know, this technology that we developed and all of this science laying unused, all the cell phones abandoned, all the MP3 players abandoned, and everyone just they'd say, well, how, what happened? How did they all go off and sit under the trees and, and meditate? Yeah. So they would think this is a very strange race of beings, very unfathomable. 
But this shows how very deeply uh, challenging and deeply transgressive this idea of like going forth is to, to, to adopt a very, very different uh, uh, code of values and a code of values which, if there weren't boundaries around it, would actually destroy society. You have no, no doubt about that. If, if everyone to undertook the code of values that monks and nuns take, then society would be destroyed very, very quickly. And so this is why we have boundaries around it. Okay? So the, the, the Sangha is not actually threatening a society because we do have those boundaries. It's only a limited, small group of people. And within that small group of people, then those things are licensed. Yeah? It's allowed. It's allowed to live our, our lives like that. It's allowed to live our lives without uh, uh, seeking to earn, earn an income, without seeking to uh, procure food for oneself and all of these kinds of things. So this gives, this gives, gives you some kind of idea of how, how uh, challenging or how um, radical that, that whole lifestyle is as, as a choice. And, you know, of course, it's only a choice for, you know, usually for a relatively small number of people. And, uh, but something that's very, very powerful. Yeah? And uh, I think that sometimes in our society, in, in, in Western society, we don't really appreciate, for a, a lot of people I see who come to the monastery, even those who are interested to ordain, uh, for them, it's, well, they want to meditate, really, and they think that putting a robe on is a more convenient way to be able to meditate. And, yeah, fair enough, you can understand that, but actually there's a lot more to it than that. It goes much, much deeper. And uh, so I guess that's all I wanted to say for this evening on, on the topic of um, transgression and uh, the way, some of the ways in which the, the um, extremely radical and, and challenging and uh, almost um, scary aspects of, of religious practice are, uh, uh, manifest themselves in Buddhism in, in sometimes in very different or surprising ways. So that's my talk for you this evening. Anyone has any comments or questions?